to the CJ Moneyway Show. And I'm with your host, CJ Moneyway. Let's get it. What's up, my good people? This your boy, CJ Moneyway. And today I have on the show Transformational Leadership Coach. And today you have the Johnson & Johnson Connection. <laughs> and so we're here. We have Certified Maxwell Leadership Coach, Andrea Johnson. How you doing today? I'm great, CJ. And I am happy to be here. I uh, thank you for coming in. I thank you for coming in. You know, we had that little mishap a little earlier, so I thank you. For your patience and stand don't around. Hell, they don't need to know. <laughs> <laughs> That's I like to be trans. We're professionals. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, before we get started, people are driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. The hiring process can be slow and overwhelming. Simplify hiring with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors according to Indeed data and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash P-O-D-K-A-T-Z 13. That's Indeed.com slash P-O-D-K-A-T-Z 13. Terms and conditions apply. Tell us, what is your approach when you walk into a business and corporations and begin implementing plans for others who have already started up businesses and things of that nature. Well, what I do with people is help them communicate better. Mm -hmm. I help them learn to listen to their teams. I help them learn to listen to their customers. I help them learn to figure out how they can grow better by knowing who they are. And so I start off as a Maxwell Leadership DISC consultant, starting off with DISC assessments. And if you're not familiar with DISC, it's a behavioral analysis tool. It helps you understand and see patterns in the ways that you communicate and the way that other people communicate. I mean, just sitting here talking to you, I'm pretty sure I have an idea that you might be an I that we call it inspirational. You're somebody who likes to tell stories and you love being on the conversation. But my husband, who's upstairs, is very much a C. He's a detail-oriented guy. He was a reporter. So he's like, everything is... Mm -hmm. No, and so um, when when we learn to understand other people's, especially our teams, especially for small businesses, when you have a small team, you really need to be able to communicate well, right? Because if you have one person on a small team that is not happy, <laughs> that is, that's bad. Uh -huh. And you know, so I actually work within teams to do that kind of work. I, I sit them down and I, I give them. It's like a ten minute assessment. Mm -hmm. And I've had people say, Andrea, I thought I was taking the practice test. Yeah. Nope, that's the real one. And it's really that accurate. And then we kind of walk through it, help them see how they need to communicate better with each other and open up the doors to having a new culture and really kind of making everything function better. Oh, OK. That, that sounds pretty cool. So so basically it's, it's like a team, a team assessment thing where we communicate with one another better and, and get things and get things out because I, I take it that if the team is, is well and then everything else will start working well and they go together for the good. Yeah. When you look at, you know, we hear these big, big stories or these big terms about, you know, engagement, employee engagement or employee retention, like making sure that you can hire an employee, train them and keep them for a long period of time. That's what everybody wants, right? That's what every employer wants. But if you don't do that, then it costs you more money as a small business owner and or even as a big business owner. I mean, it doesn't matter. It always it costs more to hire and retrain new employees than it does to retain the ones that you have. And so being able to I mean, you know, this CJ, the most important thing for each and every one of us is to believe that we've been seen and heard. Mm -hmm. Right. This is why you do this podcast. 
Yeah. Right. This is for everyday people to have their stories told. And when we are willing to look at the way other people communicate, it's like speaking their language. So we basically say to somebody on our team, like I may start with the leader or I will um, do the whole team and then we'll kind of look at it all as a, a big report and kind of put it together and say, you have this many this is and this many that's, but this is how you need to change what you're doing. Um, because what happens is people all of a sudden say, wait a minute, you care about me. Mm-hmm. Right? You care how I need to be communicated with. So instead of somebody like my husband who needs all the details, instead of just walking in and saying, What's the bottom line? Give me the bottom line. Right? Because that just creates conflict with somebody who says, Well, let me tell you how I got to this. <laughs> it's like, and I, every once in a while, I get a little impatient, you know. But because I like to tell stories and, and, you know, do the fun stuff too. And, but when I'm willing to let him, I don't even looked at him because he's helping my son with, we're trying to get out of ninth grade. I mean, it's just like <laughs> my son is 15 and we're, this is the last week of school. We got finals and all kinds of stuff. And so I looked in this morning when he was explaining something and I said, you need, you need to tell me all of this, don't you? And he goes, yeah, I really do. I said, okay. So I just closed my laptop and I just sat there and listened. <laughs> but when we're willing to do that with people, in our homes or in our businesses or in our churches or in our community centers, it makes all the difference in the world because then, you know, just like you're sitting here listening to me, now you're my best friend because you're listening to me. (laughs) And it just does something to people. It changes the atmosphere and it changes the, the way that we perceive how we fit into the whole. Oh, you know what? I'm I'm sitting here, I'm laughing. I'm thinking about what you said about, you know, how your husband and, and yourself, and me and I think our relationship and my in my relationship is the the, the opposite. So mm. my wife is somewhat like your husband, you know. <laughs> he's the more, you know, serious one and you know, I'm gonna get everything pinpointed and do things with the, with my son and then like you said, gotta tell me. <laughs> like, yeah, so so yeah, so I'm listening to that. I'm like, yeah, we just I, but you need you know, things like that because it it balances out and, you know. Yes. (laughs) We need all of us, right? We need, and we need to know who we are and who everybody else is so that when we bring it to the table, we have, I mean, what's worse than like a Thanksgiving meal with no turkey? What's worse than, you know what I mean? I mean, or whatever your traditional meal is, if you've got a big family meal that you like to have specific dishes at, what's terrible? What's more worse than like somebody not showing up with the dish they're supposed to bring? That's kind of how it is for us when we show up in our work or when we show up in our families. We were created specifically to be who we are. And if we don't show up with that, then everybody else around us misses out. I, I totally agree. So uh, so tell us about your passion for wanting to equip female leaders. Sure. I think that... Um, and I'm learning a lot about, because I, I come from an evangelical Christian background where women were supposed to be quiet and not leaders and that kind of thing. So I've gone through a little bit of a pendulum swing of like, yes, we are going to lead. And now I'm kind of back to, oh, okay, so let's see what's really out there. Um, but my passion is I would like younger women coming along behind me to not get hung up on the things I got hung up on and to be able to achieve what they would like to achieve earlier than I did it. I'm 57. And so, you know, for me, I'm heading into my second, you know, second career. I mean, like I said, my son's 15. So I got plenty of years of being like a young mom, but I don't feel it sometimes. But I do, I, I really do want to equip younger women to give them the kinds of, and many of that come out of the same kind of atmosphere that I have come out of, or I'm still in, you know, or in my same sphere to be able to say, there are ways that you can show up as you that, and there are things that we can leave behind and let go, but you don't have to wait for someone else to invite you to do something. You don't have to, to be a hundred percent qualified to apply for the job. You don't have to have an extra degree to do that. You can do it on your own. There are ways that we can lead that we don't even recognize. And my desire is to help women see that. Now, that's a good point, especially in the days that we're living in today. You know, uh, give or take, however you may want to look at it as far as uh, there is a, a movement with women as far as positions and the way that they're going. But then we also have uh, another side of it too, the cultural side, where you see where 
a lot of people, especially a lot, well, men and women for that matter, we're, we're not our worth. You know what I'm saying? It's right. like certain things that we sell ourselves short. Oh, yeah. As far as the things that we're doing on social media and, you know, out there in the world and things of that nature just to, to make money. And so I, I, I appreciate the things that you're doing where not only you, you're trying to get, you're empowering them that, hey, look, I can be more than than this i can be more than what this person said that i can be or sometimes more than even what i've th uh in thought of myself and mm -hmm. we, people like yourself to encourage others to um you know bring out the best in them you know as a cj money waste uh show say unlocking potential one dream at a time and, and yeah uh you know i look at it and uh we need more like you you know uh andrea so I just want to change courses a little bit and ask you a, a personal question. So tell us, how was it? Because when I saw this, I, I thought that it was kind of intriguing. So tell us, how was it growing up in South Korea? <laughs> well, how was it growing up in Gary, Indiana? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like I get those questions all the time. It's like I don't even know where to start. Uh -huh. But I will say this. You know, we all grow up with a perspective of our surroundings. We grow up with the environment that we're in. Mine just happened to be international. Um, I will say when I was younger, I, I felt I didn't always feel safe. Um, so some of the struggles that I had um, were from the idea that everything was different and new as a seven-year-old. My parents moved there when I was seven. My parents were missionaries. And I was in this wonderful community of expatriates and other missionaries from all different denominations. And it was like having, I actually lost one of my uncles recently. He had brain cancer. And when I shared that, my son was like, Uncle who? <laughs> because we left our immediate families behind in the States. And then all of our missionary friends were aunts and uncles. So it was this giant community of family that I didn't, I mean, I, I took it for granted at the time, but there were things going on. I was in Korea, in Seoul, Korea in the seventies and eighties, and that was a pretty volatile time for them. So for me, it was a very, um, oddly safe because the crime rate was low yet scary because there were curfews and North Koreans coming across the border into the DMZ and live ammunition being shot at planes and those kinds of things that just felt really insecure, made me feel very insecure and yet very secure in community, very secure in, in safety, like the crime rate. And it still is pretty low. And, um, but I also had a very unrealistic upbringing because we didn't have a lot. We didn't realize we were poor, right? It was one of those. It's like, I had no idea I was poor <laughs> because guess what's made in Korea, especially in the seventies and eighties, all the designer clothes, like Liz Claiborne, Evan Pacone, all those kind of things, silk dresses. I grew up on because silk is cheaper than cotton. Um, I was also, I wore actual Nike shoes in the eighties, like, cause they were made there and I got them really cheap. And so, um, those kinds of things were unrealistic for me, but I didn't know that I didn't, that we didn't have any money. I mean, we had space heaters in the house and we couldn't afford the heating oil. And my mother would wear ski suits because it was so cold in the winter. But at the same time, we spent six weeks down at a beach on the West coast because Everybody else kind of shut down in the summer. And so all the missionaries went down to our beach and we had a little cinder block cabin up in the, the, the woods right there on the ocean. And I grew up as a lifeguard. So I grew up playing tennis. <laughs> so there are things that were very contradictory. And I call it being a third culture kid. It's a very common sociological term. It's what people use when you have one culture living in another. And I'm not American and I'm not Korean. I am somewhere in the middle. So I call it being a third culture kid. And there were ways in which I got an education that I cannot even remotely duplicate anywhere, both from traveling through, you know, Hawaii back and forth or Hong Kong, because it was cheaper to buy our tickets from Texas, which is where my parents were from, Texas to Seoul, to Hong Kong, back to Seoul. Um, so we always had an extra Hong Kong trip in there, <laughs> which was because it was just cheaper. So it's like, you might as well. But having those kinds of things that nobody else could really understand, but as well as an amazing education. I went to school in an international school with kids from 65 different countries. And so 
during the Iran hostage situation, we had Iranian students there during, you know, I mean, it was just like, you name it. We, uh, we had it all. We had ambassadors, kids, we had anytime a president of an overseas company like GM, if it was the president of GM in Korea, their kids would go to our school. And so it wasn't just missionaries. It was just this real interesting mix. And I'm again, 57. So I'm, gosh, what is this? Oh, this is 24. This is my 50th high school reunion. <laughs> Really? <laughs> yeah. Um, cause I graduated in 84. Is that right? Or is that 40 years? That's 40 years. <laughs> I'll go, cause I'm on, uh, I don't do math. Yeah. I graduated in 92 myself. So, okay. So, so I think that's, 30. Yeah. So it's for me, it's 40 years, but it's just, you know, looking back, I've not been able to create that community. I've not been able, it's like nothing. I, f- I constantly feel like I'm a stranger. Mm-hmm. wherever I live because what I was raised with was just so different. And um, I jokingly asked people, well, what was it like where you were raised? Because nobody knows how to explain that. It's just, it was so different from being raised in the United States. We came back a couple of times, like we came back for sixth grade and we came back for my 10th grade year um, on what we call furlough. Mm-hmm. And I learned really fast in sixth grade because I heard some girls saying, here comes Miss Korea this and Miss Korea that. And I learned real fast to keep my mouth shut. (laughs) So, But all of those things, CJ, kind of gave me a different perspective on how we do leadership, how we show up in the world. I tried really hard for a long time to fit in and play by all the rules. And I realized that was only hurting me. And that's what, that's kind of when I say I was raised with these things, it's like, I need this message to go out to people. You need to be who you are. And part of who you are is how you were raised. I didn't tell anybody for the longest time. I didn't tell anybody I'd grown up in Korea. I just didn't. I mean, like you say, you would, you would ask people like, how was it where you came from? And, you know, just listening to you, I tell you, one thing I will tell you, Andrew, I didn't have all those opportunities to deal with all those people uh, going to school with me as you did. Yeah. But, but your environment and the things that you've done coming up, it, it molds you, it builds your character. Yes. yes. And that nature. So as you said, you wouldn't tell anyone, but it was where God put you at that time so that you can develop the things that got you to the point where you are now and a lot of people can't say that they've had that type of experience worldwide or anything else that you know just that type of exposure and so that's why mm-hmm. i know because it, like i've never known nobody to grow up in south korea so. <laughs> i know a lot of people who did how come you don't <laughs> so yes yeah, so i thank you for sharing that with us so tell us a little bit about some of the challenges that you had in your journey. Sure. I alluded to that a little bit of feeling this conflict between feeling very safe to go out and do things. We could get on the bus, you know, kids could get on the bus and, you know, pay 25 cents and ride across the city of 11 million people. No problem. And never worry. And parents, I mean, and to this day, I still watch K-dramas. I'm looking forward to lunch today to watch my K-drama, which is a Korean show. I still watch them. I have to read the subtitles because it's a difficult language, but I grew up with those conflicts of feeling insecure and unsafe. And I was a chubby kid. My family is predisposed to that genetically. And that was not normal in the seventies and eighties that it was, we just didn't have that kind of, it just was unusual. It was in the minority for sure. And so I learned to kind of deal with my own fears and my own insecurities by sneaking food. And I became bulimic and ended up with bulimia and depression. I put myself in the hospital when I was in college because then when I came home to the States, I didn't have my giant culture of and community of missionary friends. I didn't have that foundation anymore. And I tried to get involved in my church, which is all good. I tried to, my family, my grandparents and stuff were about 90 miles away. And I was in Houston and they were in Southeast Texas, but I tried joining a sorority. It just, nothing was meeting those needs for me. And I got pretty sick and put myself, I turned 20 in the hospital for a 12 week program for bulimia and depression. And so that was a challenge, but it's always been, I've always struggled. I ended up having gastric bypass surgery 19 years ago. And it just, it's still something that I deal with. It is a constant thing for me to understand my body image, how I see myself. So I developed this 
unable to like see my body for what it is and to be grateful for it. And it's just this constant need to soothe myself. Um, so that is a struggle. But in addition to that, um, I married my husband when I was 27, which was, according to my family, very late. My mom and my sister both met their husbands in 10th grade. <laughs> um, so for me, it was very late. I met him in grad school. And as a pastor's wife, that's a very challenging work. So that was something that was very, could be, can be still, still a pastor's wife, um, can be very challenging. It's very rewarding, but very challenging. And as I shared a minute ago, I kept trying to put myself in a box. I kept trying to follow rules. I kept trying to be whatever I expect. I thought other people expected me to be. Some of them were pretty clear expectations. <laughs> um, they were very out loud. You know, if, if you participate in church anywhere, there's always somebody who has an expectation of you. But the other thing that we realized, so my mother, we lost her about seven years ago to breast cancer. And that's why I had gastric bypass because I knew I wanted to take care of my body and get more healthy so that I would, my chances for breast cancer as a daughter of a breast cancer patient would go down. But in the process, realized that um, I was also in early menopause. And so at 38, I was told I really couldn't have children. And so we started the adoption process, adopted my son at 42, which is why I'm 57 with a 15 year old. That wears you out. He couldn't get him out of bed this morning. And he goes, oh, and as it said, are you okay? And he goes, no, I'm just getting old. And we're like, really? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's like, no, you're just 15. Yeah. Um, but those are the kinds of challenges that, I mean, we've been through church splits. We've been, been through all kinds of things. But CJ, when you know who you are, the more you know yourself, the more you have a taproot to hold you down when things happen the more you have a foundation upon which to stand when the winds blow really hard and when the waves crash over you, no matter what they are, because I'm sure you've had your own challenges. And I bet you interview people every single week who have challenges. The question is, how do we get up from them? The question is, how do we overcome them? And that's kind of the work that I've been doing. And that's what I like to share and how I like to encourage others because man, they're there to teach us something, you know, and um, so that's that's a little in a in a little bit of a, a, a microcosm. Some of the things that I have dealt with as far as my challenges are concerned. Yeah, uh, like you say, uh, I've had I've had my fair share of challenges, and I believe a lot of times when he has put us through the fire and brought us out. And we have an appreciation that it wasn't us and that he, you know, it was just certain things that we were supposed to go through for that moment, you know, and, yeah. and now we're here to be able to give our test uh, testimony and to try to help others who have gone through similar things and, you know, may have felt the same way that you felt, but just to let them, to encourage and inspire them. Hey, as we always say, you're not the only one. Yeah. We're through this and so and then everybody's journey is different it can be similar in, in nature but it's different because everybody is different and yep. so you may handle it one way and i may handle it another way but it's the same thing but it's the way you know the dynamics different you know mm -hmm. my wife you're not my wife and i'm not your husband but we can have situations that are similar yeah but it's handled different because our household is structured different. Yeah, and our personalities are different. Exactly. And listening to you, you know, I didn't know that. I didn't see that. And being a, uh, now that that even makes more, uh, brings more to the table that you go, that you were a past, you're a pastor's <laughs> daughter. So you, you was ready. Right up. Oh, I got all the I got all the letters. I'm the mis I'm the pastor's kid, the missionary kid, the pastor's wife. I almost have a master's of divinity. Yeah. So, you know, I almost like I put my husband through school. I went there and met him there uh -huh. in seminary and I haven't graduated. Uh -oh. So Did you on course? No, I am not on course to do it right now. It's, okay. That was back in the late 90s. Um, uh -huh. I will say this, as I, I've been self-employed for about two and a half years, and one of my dreams is to finish. And I toy around when I get in my cerebral brainiac days, because I love, I'm a thinker. I like to think there are days when I consider like a PhD and then I have friends and say, why would you want to do that now? I'm like, I don't know. We'll, we'll see if I really want to do it when it comes around. But you know, there's, there's a part of me that would really love to do that because I love reading female theologians. I love reading women who are really challenging the status quo and really making us think. And 
you know, I think we'll see. I don't know what's in store, but here I am. <laughs> hey, well, give me Lord. You know that that just how it is. You know, sometimes we and, and I don't want to uh, dwell on that too much, but sometimes we we would we think that we want to do things. Yeah, that's for us, but it may not just it may just not be in the wheel for us to do. Yeah. You know? so, right. So sometimes you just have to step back and say, well, you know, guide my steps, whatever you want me to do. Exactly. Like with this podcast. In my mind, I was supposed to do it 2013, something like that. Hmm. And, you know, I went through the you know, learning how to do a, a power director to edit edit stuff and got me some mics. and to be, But it wasn't my time. Hmm. I was ready to do it, but it wasn't my time. Just as you being a podcaster, in order to do certain things financially, it costs, mm -hmm. you know, the right. business. It costs, you know, you're not going to make any money. Nope. <laughs> <two months double. laughs> Very few people make money on podcasting. And you're not going to make no money on podcasting. So you better be able to want to just do it for the joy of it. Yes. And it's going to cost. And so even then, Andrea, I tell you, and it was meant for me to do it now because I can afford it. Mm -hmm. I can afford to do it. Back then, I thought I was ready to do it. But mm -hmm. once I had got into it, I would have realized. If people are dieting now more than ever before, then why are nearly one in three American adults overweight? Dr. Gundry, who's helped thousands lose weight and feel younger and healthier than ever, says most people are not getting enough fat-burning MCTs from their food. MCTs are a special kind of compound that instead of turning into fat when you consume it, turns into ketones, which is a chemical that breaks down the excess fat in your body. So by getting more MCTs in your diet, you essentially flip a switch that puts your body in caloric bypass mode, which can flush out excess fat and calories. And He's created an easy way for you to activate caloric bypass right at home. It's called MCT Wellness. This powerful blend of fat-flushing MCT powders and antioxidant-rich polyphenols is designed to help you unlock your body's fat-burning, energy-producing potential. What's even better is that it's a delicious drink. I love how incredible it tastes. All you do is add a scoop to water. Enjoy and watch as you start feeling slimmer and more energized. So, if you want to experience a quick, easy, and effective way to melt pounds fast, go to countrymd.com energy and order right now to get up to 53% off your regular price order with a 90-day money-back guarantee. Again, that's G-U-N-D-R-Y-M-D.com slash energy. People are driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search. Match. With Indeed. The hiring process can be slow and overwhelming. Simplify hiring with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform. With over 350 million global monthly visitors according to Indeed data. And a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash P-O-D-K-A-T-Z 13. That's Indeed.com slash P-O-D-K-A-T-Z 13. Terms and conditions apply. Like, wait a minute, this ain't what I do. <laughs> well, and you know, if, if anybody out there listening is interested, CJ and I can both tell you ways that you can save money on it. I mean, there are ways to do it. And there are plenty of people who have podcasts who probably have more listeners than I do that do it on a absolute shoestring where they record on their iPhone. And, you know, but, but you're right. There are things that there are tools that we use there. Are, if you want it to be hosted on a platform, you got to pay it, You know, I mean, it's like if you want it to go out to Apple podcasts or whatever, you still have to pay. And so you're right. There are things that we do in the right time. And, you know, right now what I'm focusing on is, um, I call myself the core values lady. Cause I just, I, 
I really want people to understand who they are. And then I work with DISC and then I work with my intentional optimism. And it just, so my, for me, my podcast is kind of marketing, mm-hmm. you know? I mean, it's like, this is, this is my free shop. It's like, you can walk in and do all the, get whatever you want out of the free shop. And then this is how you can work with me, you know? Mm-hmm. So, and for you, it's more of a, almost a big tent, right? Come on in y'all. Come on in. <laughs> <laughs> You talked about it, so let's talk about that for a second. So tell us a little about your signature tool, International Optimism, and your core value program. Well, it's actually intentional optimism and international because I grew up internationally is the number one way that people and, and you know, my friends are like, why don't you change the name? I'm like, no, it's trade. It's about trademark. Uh-huh. It's almost trademark. But I shared that I lost my mother in 2017 and I was 50. And I had an eight-year-old adopted son. And my mother was one of those people who everybody loved. She walked in a room and everybody said, Judy. And I watched her die with grace and well. And I watched her girls and their moms always have complicated relationships. It's impossible to not have a complicated relationship. If you say you don't have a complicated relationship with your money, with your mother, honey, I think that maybe you have some <laughs> other things going on that you might need to examine. But she wanted to make sure that every single thing was tied up. She wanted to make sure that we knew all we needed to know. And as her oldest, there's even more, right? I mean, she she was 23 when she had me, you know. So like I said, she met my dad in 10th grade. And so she was very intentional about making sure that, I mean, even like, do you have my cornbread recipe? I mean, all of it, right? And um, so I watched that and realized, I don't know that I'm on a path that I can actually at the, if that happened to me, am I on a path where at the end I could just say, well, do you have my cornbread recipe? Right. I think there's a lot of things I would say, I wish I had done, or I, I wish I had done differently, or I wish I had lived this better. And so I sat down and I really did some soul searching and, um, realized that there were some principles that I wanted to live out better. And so when I pulled them all together, you know, if you dump it all out on paper and then you organize them, I realized I had about six tenets and I call that intentional optimism. And because I am not a sunny optimist, I am not a Pollyanna person. It's not like, oh, it's going to be fine. (laughs) I'm this who says, why did you do that? Because now this, 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 and this is going to happen, right? So for me, it's it's a way of literally choosing to live in a way that is gracious and kind, choosing to live in a way that other people are um, lifted up, choosing to live in a way where I am present. And so the six tenets are things like optimistic, which means there's hope and there's, and it's purposeful or there's a plan present, which means I understand wonder and I'm here and I celebrate and I share my time with my son. Who's always got a meme on his phone. He wants to show me it's energetic, which means I'm life focused, right? That's kind of what we're talking about right here. It means that, um, I have joy and I share it and I look for it and I celebrate it in other people. It's courageous. That's leadership, right? Being willing to be that lead goose out there going South for the For the winter, you know, the lead goose is the one that gets all the stuff. Um, But being willing to be on an adventure, and that's where resilience comes from, is falling down and getting back up and saying, what's the next step? Being wise, and this one was kind of a surprise for me, but it was, and it's the one that's been the most difficult for me to embrace because I don't see myself as wise. Mm. You know, we don't, we tend to see other people or older people as wise. And growing up in Asia, old people are just wise. That's just... Old people are very revered, you know, Um, but people used to come. I worked for 25 years in higher education, but 23 years in two different schools of medicine, Johns Hopkins and the University of Virginia in operations and administration and research administration. And when people would come and shut my door, even doctors or the chief of the department would come and sit and talk to me because it was a safe place, because they got sound advice because they knew that I could see both sides because they knew that I would be honest with them. I realized that I actually had been given some wisdom and I need to cultivate that. I want that to be something that people walk away with. I don't consider myself to be the most knowledgeable person in the world, but I want the knowledge that I have to be shared in a way that's respectful and understanding of other people, which is where the disc comes in a little bit. But then the sixth one, that sixth tenet is intentional. 
I have to have a purpose for what I do. I need to plan for what I want. I want to grow on purpose. And so that's intentional optimism. And CJ, a lot of times when we start with growth, we start from the outside and work in, right? We start with behavior. We look, we talk about, we got to change our behavior. (laughs) Well, that's true. But where's the best place to change your behavior? In your mind and in your heart, right? So as I I started with that, and as I kind of, then I understood, I learned DISC. A friend of mine introduced me to John Maxwell's training program. And as I became a DISC consultant, I started understanding it's not, and as I became a coach, I realized all that stuff that is out here is because of what's in here. And then I started looking when I was in seminary and when I was in college, I used the Franklin Planner System. So you've heard of Stephen Covey. Stephen Covey bought out Franklin Planner. So it's now the Franklin Covey. And I ended up in 1995 doing my top 10 governing values. These are things like uh, peace and tranquility. You know, these are things I want to live out. These are like principles, honesty, transparency, physical health, family, friendship. You know, my top one was freedom. And I thought at 27, that meant that I was free of a job, (laughs) that I was, that I was, that I was my own many way, you know, I mean, it's like all of that. And, um, the more I got into coaching, I was reintroduced to this idea of the value system and what my values were and realized all of these, except for freedom are outside of me. Mm -hmm. And I needed to look to see what was inside of me. And so when I work with people on core values, I help them understand that these are the principles and priorities that govern your actions. They're the things that you're born with, you're hardwired, they're your non-negotiables. These are your foundational convictions. So for somebody like my husband is, he hasn't done this exercise, but it's probably something like honesty. Like you lie to him and it is. (laughs) But he's going to be honest with you, like to a fault. Like, I mean, it's like, (laughs) Yeah, it's like he's going to tell me all the steps, right? So, but when I started realizing that for me to honor, it's not aligning core values. We don't align with something out there. We honor what's in here. That's when we can show up the best that we possibly can. And so I tell people, this is what makes you a magnetic leader. It's being able to stop acting with and imitating other people's principles and priorities and defining your own or uncovering your own for what I would call sustainable or impactful leadership. So even if it's in your church or your community or your job as a business owner or as a team member, when you show up as you, then you have the authority to act in ways that are beneficial to you and everyone else. You have the ability to be empowered and enjoy your work because you figure out what it is. You have the conviction to lead in ways that go with your passions or the things that you believe in. And you have the confidence to set internal boundaries and make sure that everyone else is honored as you act out and and move through your life with your own core values intact. And so was that to brainiac or I mean, because I think it's it's one of these things that I love to talk with people about and help them understand. As a matter of fact, I'm next next Friday or Thursday, I'm doing a big conference down in the Lynchburg area because I'm in Charlottesville. And it's like a room full of women. And this is what we're going to talk about is core values. And and I know it's going to be great doing something like that. So have you ever what's the biggest crowd that you have spoken in front of? This is a sort of a keynote. Um, so it's about 200. I haven't yet done big crowds. I also, you know, when you get to know yourself, CJ, you realize what you're good at. I always thought I wanted to be a big keynote speaker. Yeah. But then I realized I need the back and forth. Uh-huh. And I absolutely love workshops. So I am much more of a workshop type person. I do disc workshops. I do core value workshops. And I love pouring into other people who are dedicated to learning. So I do a lot of work at the chamber. They have a leadership training program. It's called the Leader Lab. And I was able to do my core values in there last year. And I'm, they've asked me to do it again this year. So um, those kinds of things are where I find it's not necessarily in the big arena. I mean, I could do it in a big arena. But what I really want to know is, what's your core value, right? So I can't get down on a one-on-one basis if I'm in a big, humongous group of people. but Honest to goodness, my mother's memorial service was probably the biggest crowd I've ever spoken in front of. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I think we had 400 people there. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's a, like you said. Oh, she, was, she was loved. I, I, I was listening to you earlier say that 400 people. Yeah, that's, a, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of love. And, it, you know, it makes you feel good to know that 
you know, somebody who you loved as much was that um, in- influential in other people's lives and touched their lives as well. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I, it's very inspiring too. And it's so like to look at that and say, I, I, I can't be her. I don't want to be her. She was who she is and I am or who she is and I am who I am. But there are things that principles that she lived out that I could do. And that's why I came up with intentional optimism. So I have the core values, which is who you are. And the disc is how you communicate it. And we understand patterns of other people's speech and we can talk to them and help them understand who we are, build bridges. And then intentional optimism is how we do what we do. It's this lifestyle of living things out in a way that honors ourselves and others at the same time. You know, uh, I was listening to you earlier. You was talking about one of the core values and me and my mother, we were just talking about this the other day. And one of them, as you said, it starts with the renewing of the mind. Absolutely. So that's what, because once you start renewing your mindset, even things that you may have said back in the past or did back in the past, when your mind is renewed, you don't see it the same. I don't see that situation. Like I used to, you feel me? And so, and so when you said that, that was kind of that that resonated with me because we were just talking about that. And it was another thing that you said too. And I'm not going to hold you any long. I'm going to ask you one more question. Oh. One other thing you said too that made me think about just the type of person that you are, uh, humble. Hmm. Because I, I know it's, it's something in the word that it, it says that. We shouldn't boast about ourselves, but let others, you know, saying say certain things about it. Yeah. Said about ourselves because it's the humbleness. Because I don't want to think too highly of myself than I ought to. Yes. Once I do that, then you know he he knocks me down a bit. So I stay, you know, and it sounds to me that you stay even keel. But when you have people. But that high 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 uh, quality or integrity, or you work in that uh, John Hopkins Hospital, and then you got all these big time people coming in to talk to you, to get yeah. intimate understanding for you. It's a <laughs> it's an unseen thing that uh, and talent that God placed in you just for others, and it, it's a beautiful thing. Just sitting here talking to you, Andrea, you know. I'm inspired. <laughs> oh, thank you. I mean, that is my goal is to inspire others to be who they are designed to be. You know, we all have God's fingerprint on us and it's good. It's, it's not the same fingerprint. There's certain things about us that they're that just unique to you and unique to me. And I want to enable and encourage you to show up how you are. I mean, I had a conversation at church after church, this woman who started a new business and she says, well, everybody's telling me I'm pricing too low. And I'm like, well, you got to price what you want to price it. But here's the deal. You got to know that you have worth, right? It's like, you have to know that your time is worth something. And her husband went, oh, (laughs) and you know, and so she said, and I said, on that, you can just go think about that for, you know, the next week until I see you again, you know, and, but that's part of it. CJ is understanding that we have inherently have worth we inherently have value. And when we understand who we are, then we can bring that to other people. That's how we make a difference. That's how the world gets changed. I, I totally agree. You know, you have to be transparent with yourself. As you say, your husband is sometimes to a fault. <laughs> and, you know, just honest, you have to you have to know yourself. And when we, as the platform that we're in now, as you're doing your podcast, me doing my podcast, you have to let people in. Mm-hmm. You know, everything is not just, oh, look at me now. No, it, it's been some scars. Yeah. It's been some losses, you know, that some had to endure. And if you're not willing to be honest with people about your journey, then what are we doing it for? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's last- all about the journey. Okay. Yeah, well, no, I was just going to say, there are things that we have to actually let go of and we have to grieve them just like we grieve a loss of a person. And when we learn things about ourselves that we don't want to have anymore, like we want to let go of certain things, there's there's work to be done. <laughs> when we are aware of something that needs to, it's not all sunshine and roses. My last podcast episode was literally grief amid change or grief amid victories because the more we learn, like I told you, I live here in Charlottesville, Virginia. You don't live through August 11th and 12th in Charlottesville, Virginia of 2017 without changing somehow. Mm. And that was 
God really opened our eyes and really made changes in our hearts. And that was part of the the big change that kind of put me on a path to do something completely different because I had just lost my mother. So I was nice and raw. And then Charlottesville happened and it was just, this is okay. What do you say, Ed Lord? It's like, there's a whole lot of ways for me to show up that are, can be very different than how I have in the past. Not that I was a bad person. I just was a I was apathetic. I was walking through and I wasn't being who God hadn't designed me to be. And even though there were times, you know, we do that, we shine brightly at moments, but what about being intentional about shining? What about how, how can we actually do that in a way that is much more purposeful and can really create an impact? So I think that's the piece that I just, I feel very passionate about. Yeah. And and I, I totally agree with you. And so since you talked about that, and I'm going to have that to be the last question, tell us a little bit about your podcast show, Stand Tall and Own It. Yeah, I'm only five, one and a half. So there's a little bit of a play on standing <laughs> tall. But, you know, CJ, when we don't feel confident about something, we kind of hunch our shoulders and we kind of get small. And you watch teenagers as they grow. Some of them, like my son, just shot up really fast. And they kind of like, they're not comfortable with it. So they kind of like hunch over and and we talk quietly and stuff. But when we learn who we are and we gain the confidence in ourselves, then we are able to put our shoulders back and say, you know, what you think about me matters to a certain extent, but in as long as I'm living in a way that I know honors me and honors you and honors God, it, I it's okay, right? Whatever, you know, you think. So um, the first two years of my podcast was all about female leadership. It's all about um, women in leadership. And it was called Unconventional Leaders, Intentional Optimists, Unconventional Leaders. But I realized I learned so much from these women that I was interviewing that I actually had to make changes and I actually had to live it out, which is why I was like, this needs a whole new rebrand. I got to stand tall. I got to own this stuff. And that's what I'm encouraging women and men now. As a matter of fact, I have my first male interviewee the first time on episode 182. So yeah, but it's like realizing that the things that I kind of had to learn to let go of, things like patriarchy, things like white privilege, things, you know, all those things that I had to learn to let go, things, even just things that had to do with whether or not I was a good person or all these things, we have to say them out loud. Mm -hmm. If we don't say them out loud, everybody else, you mentioned this earlier, thinks they're by themselves. So on the podcast, you're going to get those kinds of things. You're going to get me saying things like, you have to grieve who you were in order to be who you are. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to shoot it straight. Most of the time it's encouraging. Every once in a while, I'm going to slap you around. But um, I have some amazing guests every so often as well. And I share tools and I share tips uh, on how to grow. And I share a lot about my own like core value stuff, the one coming out Oh, actually, that's today's Monday. So the one coming out today is the difference between a core value and a principle, a life principle, right? Because we want to know the difference and there's a lot of talk out there. So I would uh, love to know that you listen to the show. So let me know if you if you check it out, DM me through Instagram or LinkedIn and let me know that you heard about me on CJ Moneyway and I'll know that you're not spam and <laughs> I'll let me know what you think. <laughs> yeah, and, and also... Join a program or at least sign up and, and see the things that she has. I signed up. I believe I signed up the other day. Okay. Uh, or, and I, you know, the newsletters and things like okay. that. Okay. Man, I'm still baffled here a little bit. My Johnson sister, I'm still <laughs> baffled here a little bit that you said that you hadn't had a man on your show. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, 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 it was. It was a female leadership show. And what I was doing was I was interviewing women to Uh show other women that you don't have to be a six foot tall, blonde haired, blue eyed man with a master's of business administration in order to be a leader. And so I was pulling leaders from all different walks of life. And so this first gentleman that I interviewed, he's 80, 85. And we're talking about he didn't understand that he had ADHD until he was 57. Mm -hmm. And my son has ADHD. And so that's one of the things some of my clients, while I've worked with them, have figured out they have ADHD. So 
I'm now starting to look at topics rather than women's leadership and pulling out specific topics that help people. That's something we need to own as well, right? If we are neurodivergent or if we have a specific skill set, we need to stand tall and own those things. So this was an opportunity to get me out of my comfort zone and interview this amazing man who grew up in Nazi occupied Holland and say, all right, I can learn a lot from him. And we had a fabulous conversation. So I'm excited for that to come out at the end of June or the end of May. Yeah. Well, I look forward to following you on your podcast. Now that I know the first 180 photos of women empowerment. <laughs> I will say, once I rebranded, it's a little less women's empowerment. It's a little more, it's a whole lot more of individual empowerment. It's like a whole lot more of like, this is what we need to do. And so I'm always, I get some of my best comments from men. So. I'm just joking with you because <laughs> nah, nah, I'm, I'm joking with you because you had a niche, you know, yeah. as they say. And Alex continued, you know, they, what's your niche? What's your niche and your avatar? I can't find it, you know, <laughs> as far as, you know, doing this because it's such a variety of people that I may interview like yourself and others. Everybody have different thought process and it's a different story and it's a different journey and you know, somebody that's listening might get something different from this person than they got from the last person. Mm. But I, I say that to say that because when I first started my podcast, I wanted to, my niche wanted to be, and I still think I'm going to do that in October with another one. Is I wanted to actually talk to me. Mm. I did mm -hmm. a platform for the everyday man. Mm hmm the celebrities, they had a platform, but they talk about celebrity stuff. <laughs> I wanted to talk to men about the things that we go through on a daily basis. Yeah. And although that was my thought process and that's what I was being led to do, he changed courses on me because I had women to come to me that was watching the show and listen to it. They say, well, Corey, why you ain't got no women on your show? And one thing I know about women, more so than men, women will tune in and they will listen. And most women, if they find something exciting, hey, 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 hey you got to listen to this. You're <laughs> hear it. Yeah. You got to listen to this because it's something that they want you to hear. So so that's what made me change course on that. Uh, cool. that I understand what you're talking about. When you have a niche and you have something that you're aiming for, Hey, go for it. And so can you tell us where we can follow you at on social media, your handles or, you know, uh, as far as your website, anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. I am The Intentional Optimist. So that's my website, theintentionaloptimist.com. Like I mentioned a minute ago, if you find me on Instagram, Andrea Johnson, The Intentional Optimist, or on LinkedIn, either one of those. If you DM me, tell me you heard me on CJ Moneyway and I will know that you're not spam. I will know that you're some of the good people that listen to his show. And that way we can have a conversation. If you're interested in core values, when you go to my homepage, there's a button at the top right above my head that says free core values exercise. It will give you a one page downloadable that will, or is it one page? Did you do this or is that what you did? I'm not sure. Uh, um, I didn't do that one. You just sign up for the newsletter. It will sign you up for the newsletter. But if you get the one pager, it'll give you the instructions on how to start your own journey and how to figure out your own core values. Mm -hmm. And if that's not enough, you can, I mean, if you need more help, I have a small course that you can walk through. I also have some coaching that I'm doing. I'm figuring out how I want to do it. I think it's going to be individual. So far, everybody's liking the individual coaching where you go through the course and I do coaching sessions with you after each of your modules that you do, which is really helping people to figure out what their core values are. But on my website, there's the core values course, there's disc assessments, there's all kinds of stuff, or just email me either way, Andrea at the intentional optimist.com and I'll get it and I'll respond. Oh, okay. So you all heard it here. Go to our website, sign up for the course, get your free core value assessment to see where you are in life. This has been the Johnson & Johnson Connection <laughs> on DJ Money Way Show. We out of here. Peace.